Um, thank you, Paolo, for a very generous introduction and a very generous invitation, and thanks also to the Orpheus for hosting us. Um, okay. Can you hear me? So the title for the presentation is Artistic Research Between Inquiry and Revolt. Artistic Research, the University, and the Trajectory of a Deleuzian Motif. And it may help to contextualize this a little. Normally, I don't read a paper, so this is making me very nervous. Um, it seems clear by now, if there ever was any doubt, that there is no, as yet, hegemonic dispensation as to what constitutes the propriety of research activity for the arts. From the Anglophone practice-based research and practice-led research to the more mainland European construction of artistic research, from sensuous knowledge to non-knowledge, from art science to nameless science, from embodied knowledge to dissident knowledge, from the emethodos hoyle of artistic process to the radical opacity and singularity of an artist's method, from wild knowledge to eventual knowing. The competing accounts of the saliency, valency, and alterity of the arts as apparatuses of agile inquiry or as hotbeds of dissenting research are still in play, still in contest. This contest is marked not only by a confident multiplication of nomenclature, but also by recurrent pronouncements on the institutions of expertise and knowledge in general, on the encumberments of the university, on the veil of tears that is the Bologna process, and so forth. Within this field of discursive production, I find myself with many others in the middle of the contestation, disagreeing with this tendency that is becoming dominant, not Deleuzean becoming, just an old-fashioned becoming dominant of a way of talking, the ascent to hegemony of a set of tropes within a discursive community's repertoire. I disagree. I do not accept the dominant tendency of this discourse which is to problematize the university and the modern system of the disciplines, but to naturalize the artists and the modern system of the arts. I am motivated by the currency of the line of flight as a motif within this naturalization of art as intrinsically critical micropolitical existence micro-political resistance and escape, especially when it is accompanied by the refusal of ideological analysis that draws, a refusal of ideological analysis that draws its argument from authority of the deleuze Guattari text. Because it may be that it is precisely an analytic of ideology that might serve to help understand why the currency of this figure line of flight accompanies a renewal of aesthetic exceptionalism, an assertion of art as a privileged practice, of a determinacy, art as a wild, a wildness emanating from beyond disciplinarity, from beyond control, from the beyond that is imminent to artistic agency. So in the original description of this work today, it was announced that this presentation seeks to problematize a certain appropriation of the Deleuzean devices. What was not announced was that I would read two texts, two parallel texts com comprising multiple citations in alternation. I should therefore indicate why this strategy has been adopted. Firstly, of course, this doubling, reading two texts, is not really a strategy to achieve the multiple. It is just me double speaking. And as such, it is probably a movement precisely away from the multiple, as we've been warned by Deleuze Guattari. Quoting, in truth, 
it is not enough to say, long live the multiple. Difficult as it is to raise that cry, no typographical, lexical, or even syntactical cleverness is enough to make it heard. The multiple must be made, not by always adding a higher dimension, but rather in the simplest of ways by dint of sobriety, with the number of dimensions one already has available, always n minus one, the only way the one belongs to the multiple, always subtracted. But I should be clear from this beginning, I do not operate a Deleuzean lexicon. Rhizomes, bodies without organs, planes of imminence and becoming woman are not the conceptual instruments in my toolbox, nor indeed is ideological analysis for that matter. Rather, my tools are somewhat even more old-fashioned and drawn from the sometimes discredited traditions of rhetoric. So when I speak, I typically speak of rhetors, not rhizomes, of barbarisms and bathos, not bodies without organs, of prolepsis, not plain of imminence, of digression, not becoming woman, of tropes and topos, not of territorializations. A simple example of the kind of rhetorical analysis that one can do in the field of artistic research is in the slide above there where Sarat Maharaja's pronouncement. In the everyday use of paradigm, we tend to mean a worldview, a set of attitudes or approaches. In more rigorous usage drawn from philosophy of science debates, it refers to the conceptual toolkit, the underlying principles of a particular model of thinking and doing. So here we have the substitution of one metaphor, worldview, by another metaphor, toolbox, but it invokes an argument from authority, philosophy of science debates, that must be very serious and guarantee the legitimacy of the particular metaphor choice that is proposed. So this work of rhetoric is not just a work of analysis. It is also, It is also a practical work of art making. So I speak of and through the clumsy transports of metaphors with a white man's forked tongue. And so I will read a parallel, I will read another text, a text on a skepticism about dialogues. And it goes something like this. Our brothers and sisters are drowning, having crowded the boats, the metaphors that shuttle across Mara Nostrum, our sea, boats in repeating waves in daily errands of desperation. Now drowned, some of our brothers and sisters are granted European citizenship posthumously. They become our dead fellow citizens, so they may be buried on this side of our sea, without the cost of ferrying the sea-wet corpses back to an African or a Levantine shore. In the news they speak of the search and rescue mission of our border police. It is of course only in such a monologue that our immigration policy, fortress Europe and its exclusion unto death can masquerade as a humanitarian bid to save lives. Our mass media may appear multiple, many-voiced, but it is all the more a monologue when many hands and many voices repeat the same, the same, the same. Often dialogue appears to offer a way around this interminable repetition of the same old story. This is not dialogue as a transaction between territories and identities. This is dialogue as a difficult state of emergence wherein identities are suspended as we temporarily belong together, pulsing or tossed about in the ebb and flow of conversational encounter as we become bodies floating unfixed in the water of their own speaking. But between which speakers can such dialogue emerge? Who will listen and who will talk in turn? Will it be our brothers and sisters who were not asked whether we may call them such? Will it be you and I who were not asked if we may be called we? Who will we become within these yet to happen dialogues of the far sea crossing? Who can speak above the noise of this traffic between places three hours away by budget jet 
and package tour. So in the original abstract for the presentation, I point to the currency of the rhizomatic construction line of flight that has been multiplied in the discursive fields of artistic research and a contestation of what the actualities of the university, the academy might be. There are many sources that I could draw upon to demonstrate this, and my choice here is somewhat arbitrary. I, I will start by drawing upon my friend and colleague, Professor Heng Schlager's use of this figure of line of flight and his contribution to the Rutledge Handbook on Artistic Research. And Heng speaks of the creation of a flashing line of flight constituting a zone of reflexivity seems to be of immense topical interest in today's visual art. After all, artistic research as an operational process is an open-ended work in pre-growth. In artistic practices, it is by definition impossible to research the artistic process in a manner different from a form of operational process. There, therefore, in artistic research, a self-reflexive movement continuously questions shifting situations and also determines shifting positions in a constant process of interacting, intermingling, and traversing of its lines and domains of analysis. As a consequence, artistic research continually produces novel connections, accelerations, and mutations in temporary, flexible, and open systems. Still staying close to home, I can also cite my colleague Simon Sheikh's 2009 article in the journal Art and Research, where he mobilizes the figure of the line of flight as follows. Thinking is, after all, not equivalent to knowledge. Whereas knowledge is circulated and maintained through a number of normative practices, disciplines as it were, Thinking is here meant to employ networks of indiscipline, lines of flight and utopian questionings. Against the disciplinarity of knowledge, Sheikh proposes a radically different dispensation for the a-disciplinarity of the artistic. He continues, indeed we can see a number of transformations in contemporary art practices, a certain openness or expansiveness in regards to its objects of knowledge, if not discursive formations, an interdisciplinary approach where almost anything can be considered an art object in the appropriate context, and where more than ever before there is work being produced within an expanded practice, intervening in several fields other than the traditional art sphere, touching upon such areas as architecture and design, but also philosophy, sociology, politics, biology, science, and so on. Art thus has a very privileged, if impermanent, but crucial position and potential in contemporary society, but crucial in its very slippage, in that it cannot hold its ground as a discipline or institutional place. A contrasting use of this same figure, the line of flight, may be found in Bernard Stiegler's use of the term in a contribution to a volume on the future of art education produced by the European League of Art Institutes, where he conjoins the figure lines of flight with the old-fashioned idea of avant-garde, an old idea currently undergoing some reheating. Stiegler says, I understand the potential of creative territories as the possibility of an avant-garde territory, that is an area capable of inventing a new cultural, social, economic and political model of offering prefigurations of alternative lines of flight to those of a consumer society that has now reached exhaustion. A fourth and final example I draw from Irit Rogoff's use of this figure in her famous turning essay of 2008 where in discussing the exhibition Academy at the Van Abba Museum, she writes, there were many questions circulating in our spaces in the exhibition with each room and each group producing their own questions in relation to the central one, what can we learn from the museum? There were questions regarding who produces questioning, what are legitimate questions and under what conditions can they be produced? The seminar class, the think tank, the government department, the statisticians bureau are sites for the production of questions, 
But we were suggesting others born of fleeting, arbitrary conversations between strangers, of convivial loitering, and of unexpected lines of flight in and out of the museum. So my concern is the tendency for the line of flight to be operated as a figure that posits artistic agency as always already extra institutional that posits institution as fundamentally not something to be operated in good faith, but rather as something to seep away from, to leak from, to flee from, as something to be opportuned by a contestatory logic that finds its legitimation simply in the presumptuous claim to bear and honor alterity, long live the multiple. And that naturalizes artistic constructions, the institution of the artist, for example, as pertaining to a register or mode of assemblage that is fundamentally other than that of the university academy museum. Art and artist construed as natural givens, not as historical confections formatted historically in bourgeois revolt and contestation appropriation of the aristocratic privilege to work, but never to labor. But who will listen and who will talk in turn? There are no guarantees and dialogue may also double speak. It is notable that it is primarily through a series of dialogues that the platonic preference for the one over the multiplicitous and therefore presumably duplicitous many has been transmitted across millennia. These platonic dialogues have made their own journeys back and forth across the same RC, traveling east, west, and south, north. They are carried through the centuries by murmuring huddles in Syrian and Alexandrine scribal halls, in Byzantine libraries, in Andalusian universities, and in Ficino's Florentine workshop. They are shared with wider worlds as they transcribe and recode themselves from Greek to Arabic and Latin. These dialogues echo in transcultural conversations, repeating things said by saying another thing, migrant voices re-speaking the platonic one good notion. So other people have worried on this difficulty with respect to the line of flight. Gerald Rownig has put it succinctly and potently when he asserts, in 1980, at the climax of Deleuze and Guattari's collaboration, the line of flight became a central concept within a bundle of conceptual creations in vicinity to and interference with other new concepts such as deterritorialization, the body without organs, smooth space, and nomadology. Whereas these notions seem to have become almost ubiquitous in certain decade, in certain discourses over the last decades, their specification has never reached an appropriate clarity. The effect of this inaccuracy in the adaptation of Guattari and Deleuze's concept is on the one hand a depoliticization of these concepts and on the other hand, and as a result, an extensive denunciation of its authors as postmodern relativists, hippies and quixotic theory poets. Rounded references the appropriation of the figure of Melville's Bartleby under the heading of the line of flight and then goes to the master text of Deleuze and Guattari to contest any possible misreadings. He cites Deleuze Guattari as follows. As for the line of flight, would it not be entirely personal? The way in which an individual escapes on his or her own account, escapes responsibilities, escapes the world, takes refuge in the desert or else in art, false impression. In this way, pointing resolutely at the refusal of a merely reductive reading of line of flight as an invocation of subjective retreat, Rounig begins his clarification of the line of flight. Rounig's approach seems completely supported by the Deleuze Guattari text. Again, it is wrongly said in Marxism in particular that a society is defined by its contradictions. 
This is true only on the larger scale of things. From the viewpoint of micropolitics, a society is defined by its lines of flight, which are molecular. There is always something that flows or flees, that escapes binary organizations, the resonance apparatus, and the overcoding machine. Things that are attributed to changes in value, the youth, women, the mad, etc. May 1968 in France was molecular, making what led up to it all the more imperceptible from the viewpoint of macro politics. Those who evaluated things in macro political terms understood nothing of the event because something unaccountable was escaping. The politicians, the parties, the unions, many leftists were utterly vexed. They kept repeating over and over again that conditions were not ripe. It was as though they had been temporarily deprived of the entire dualism machine that made them valid spokespeople. Another commentator has announced that a line of flight is a path of mutation precipitated through the actualization of connections among bodies that were previously only implicit or virtual that releases new powers in the capacities of those bodies to act and respond. And again, Deleuze Guattari are explicit. Lines of flight, for their part, never consist in running away from the world, but rather in causing runoffs, as when you drill a hole in a pipe. There is no social system that does not leak from all directions, even if it makes its segments increasingly rigid in order to seal the lines of flight. There is nothing imaginary, nothing symbolic about a line of flight. There is nothing more active than a line of flight among animals or humans. Even history is forced to take that route rather than proceeding by signifying breaks. What is escaping in a society at a given moment it is on lines of flight that new weapons are invented to be turned against the heavy arms of the state. These platonic dialogues have made their own journeys back and forth across the same hour sea, migrant voices re-speaking the platonic one good notion. But there is more than one ocean, and there is more than one ocean crossing, and there is m more than one way to repeat a thing said by saying another thing. Odamankoma Kerema says, Odamankoma Kerema says, the great drummer of Odamankoma says, the great drummer of Odamankoma says, that he has come from sleep that he has come from sleep and is arising and is arising like a coco the cock like a coco the cock who clucks who crows in the morning who crows in the morning we are addressing you yere ke yere wo we are addressing you, ye re ke ye re wo. Listen, let us succeed. Listen, may we succeed. The poet Edward Kamau Braithwaite speaks repeating as he ventriloquized for the creator being Odaman Koma, the first artist maker. This is the Akan creator being Odaman Koma, who has made Kayarema the drummer and who also ventriloquizes through Kayarema. This is an image of words circulating not in dialogue, but in rapture, in drumming, in singing, and in speaking through God, speaking through us. Braithwaite, Udamankoma, Kayarama announce the crowing of a cock in the morning, a calling out that says, listen, you are being called to. The poet declares the divine ventriloquism of Udamankoma as a summons, listen, you are being called to. But who is this Udamankoma that pretends to call out and address us? 
So it is clear that the line of flight is elaborated without valorizing retreat, withdrawal of the beautiful soul from the irredeemably fallen world. But it is perhaps within the production of summary examples and sideways glances against concrete instances that a confusion arises that gives an opportunity to presume the line of flight as a figure of personal exodus, escape, retreat, withdrawal. There is the reference to the mosaic exodus. In the case of the Jewish people, a group of signs detaches from the Egyptian imperial network of which it was a part and sets off down a line of flight into the desert, pitting the most authoritarian of subjectivities against despotic significance, the most passional and least interpretive of delusions against interpretational paranoid delusion, in short, a linear proceeding and grievance against the irradiating circular network. And there is, of course, the most famous example, the reference to George Jackson and the Black Panthers. I may be running, but I'm looking for a gun as I go. This is conjoined with the reference to nomads and leaving the pharaoh thunderstruck. It was along lines of flight that the nomads swept away everything in their path and found new weapons, leaving the pharaoh thunderstruck. It is possible for a single group or a single individual even to exhibit all the lines we have been discussing simultaneously, but it is most frequently the case that a single group or individual functions as a line of flight. That group or individual creates the line rather than following it. It is itself the living weapon it forges rather than stealing one. Lines of flight are realities. They're very dangerous to societies, although they can get by without them and sometimes manage to keep them to a minimum. Interestingly, Adrian Parr, commenting on this figure in the Deleuze Dictionary, reads this last line from Deleuze Guattari and proposes that Art functions as a line of flight, traversing individual and collective subjectivities and pushing centralized organizations to the limit. It combines a variety of effects and percepts in a way that conjugate one another. These examples, I believe, can easily slip into the reading of line of flight as a figure of retreat, escape, deferral of action, and as the evasion of institution one might reasonably think that simply taking an institution's resources, say a salary as a teacher or as a researcher, but withdrawing, refusing to take responsibility for the co-authoring of the institution's culture or co-producing its ethos or attempting to reform its modes and protocols constitutes such a reductive enactment of this figure. And the contemporary manifestation of what I'm terming bourgeois revolt is precisely this inhabiting of institutional privileges, but disdaining institutional responsibility or investments. And to hear that word investment, not as a term of capital, but as a much older term, a term that is related to investiture and the taking on of a particular clothing. This is not an accusation I lay at the feet of Deleuze Guattari, but it is one I would make to many of my colleagues. And while I do not place this at the feet of Deleuze Guattari, I do wonder if there is something within the blithe referencing of the Black Panther's violence and its easy reproduction as referent, as image, as metonymy by middle-class European university students and teachers that is fundamental to this problematic. Perhaps the valorization of fleeing, finding, making weapons becomes an unhappy reworking of an avant-gardist trope that finds its suasive charge, its effective density, its ability to move us precisely as a kind of half-hearted revolutionary chic. 
The revolution will not be televised, but it might apparently micro-politically be publicly funded, salaried, mortgaged, exhibited, and valorized as properly artistic through institutions we do not subscribe to. But who is this Odom and Coma that pretends to call out and addresses? Some say that Odom and Coma is the first being, the first being to become corpse. Odom and Coma is many and is everywhere visible. She first created water, the primordial ocean. She then created heaven and earth by lifting up the one and setting down the other. Then other creatures followed, mankind and the beast, the thousands of powers, those things that are seen and those that are not, the numerous things in this world. Odom and Coma created death and death killed her. This is why Odom and Coma repeats, for the year has come round again. It is the poet tourist Edward Kamau Braithwaite who ventriloquizes with Odom and Coma in these lines I use. Kamau Braithwaite has been described as prominent among the artists whose theory and creative work investigate the impact of residually oral forms as fundamental cultural constructs and modalities of vision in diasporan people's imagination. Here in Braithwaite's ocean crossing imaginary from Ghana and Le Cote d'Ivoire to Barbados and Jamaica, from Africa to the Caribbean. There is a working through of the intricacies of the one, of the two, and of the many, of life and of death, but not in the way of the platonic one good notion. So Gerald Rownig's move to call attention to a proper usage of the line of flight figure seems straightforward and clear. But it seems that there are possible problems with any move like this that seeks to police the Deleuze Guattarian discourse. And it is notable that there is a strong tendency within the secondary literature that has multiplied around Deleuze and Guattari to see a certain attempt to police the use of the lexicon. And I'm thinking here of Ian Buchanan's wonderfully compressed treatment of the assemblage, Eric Allier's uh, critique of relational aesthetics for its co-option of the Deleuzean lexicon for the purposes of business as usual, and also Simon O'Sullivan and Stephen Zepka, who recently, in the introduction to a volume on Deleuze and contemporary art, noted that Without wishing to be overly cynical about the fashion economy of the art world and its voracious hunger for ever new theoretical product, the incredible proliferation of rhizomatic, nomadic, and of course relational artists and artworks that have recently inundated the art world is perhaps a symptom of a much wider transformation that is not specific to art but which has certainly included the latter as a willing partner. Globalization and the concurrent explosion of information technology have created a ubiquitous inter internationalism where local discourses and styles are frequently reduced to color, justifying the seemingly endless parade of biennales, triennials, art fairs, and other such mega events. Contemporary art and theory encompasses the globe, but often expresses little more than a global homogenization. insisting on the correct way to read the Deleuze Guattari text seems not the most felicitous way to negotiate the conceptual construction enacted in these collaborative texts. This is an especially tricky issue given precisely the refusal of hermeneutics, rhetoric, and metaphor operative in the Deleuzean corpus. Deleuze and Guattari have indicated what they call the problem of writing. The problem of writing in order to designate something exactly, exact expressions are utterly unavoidable. Not at all because it is a necessary step or because one can only advance by approximations. Anexactitude is in no way an approximation. On the contrary, it is the exact passage of that which is underway. They continue, we invoke one dualism only in order to challenge another. 
we employ a dualism of models only in order to arrive at a process that challenges all models each time mental correctives are necessary to undo the dualisms we had no wish to construct but through which we must pass. This is a kind of pragmatics, a pragmatics of writing as emergent use, writing as a kind of making of a conceptual tool, not as representation of a prefigured mental content. But it is also a licensing of a procedure that is a heuristic rather than hermeneutic operation with language. Elsewhere in the famous interview for Liberation, Deleuze is challenged on the question of his approach to language. The questioner, you emphatically reject metaphors, analogies too, but you use the notion of black holes borrowed from contemporary physics to describe spaces you can't escape from once you're drawn in. They're linked to your notion of white walls. You see a face as a white wall with black holes in it and proceed to articulate faciality on that basis. And then earlier on in the book, you're always talking about fuzzy sets and open systems. These links with very contemporary science lead one to wonder whether scientists might make of a work like this. Aren't they likely to see it as full of metaphors? And the Luz responds, but there are also essentially inexact, yet completely rigorous notions that scientists can't do without, which belong equally to scientists, philosophers, and artists. What we're interested in, you see, are modes of individuation beyond those of things, persons, or subjects. The individuation, say, of a time of day, of a region, a climate, a river, or a wind, of an event, and maybe it's a mistake to believe in the existence of things, persons, or subjects. So maybe, thinking with Deleuze, it's a mistake to believe in the existence of artworks, artists, and artist researchers. Maybe it might be possible to consider the individuation, say, of an encounter, an event of inquiry, that worked upon the inquirers so as to force an abandon of their self-images as sui genres, artist radicals. To force an abandon of self-positioning and in the place of re-announcing their, our, cherished self-representation, perhaps we could do something among the living and the dead that thickened the air with Europe's imperial inheritance. Perhaps we could take responsibility for the institutional privileges we disdain, even as we invest them with our exhibitions, our performances, our opinions, our grievances, our artistic desirings, our performance of resistance. In the small institution that is an academic conference, we gather to speak together in many different kinds of dialogue and imaginaries. We allow ourselves to speak and to sing in strange and familiar voices. And so throughout these dialogues, there are contradictions, there are insights, there are lacunae, there are aporia. There are obscurities and difficulties. There are loud and quieter voices. There are lulls and swells. There are occasional storms and calming breezes, and there are serene, inevitable tidal reversals, metaphors, return, eternal. In the interview cited earlier, Deleuze is challenged on the fashionability of ideas and books in a system of celebrity. In response, he speaks of an affinity across different disciplines, different modes. So the question again, these days, books in general, and philosophy books in particular, are in an odd position. On the one hand, there's a cult of celebrity trumpeting spurious books concocted from current fashions. On the other hand, we see a sort of refusal to analyze people's work based on some hazy notion of expression. A philosophy book is at once a difficult sort of book, yet something anyone can use, an amazingly open toolbox, as long as they have some use for it, want to use it in some particular situation. A thousand plateau offer us knowledge effects, but how can we 
present it without turning it into an opinion effect, a star effect, amidst all the chattering that each week discovers some important new week, new work. The way the opinion makers talk, you'd think we didn't need any concepts at all that we could get by just as well with some vague subculture of magazines and reviews. Philosophy as an institution is under threat, but this book full of scientific, literary, musical, and ethological uh, ritornellos sets out to work with concepts. It actually embodies with great force a gamble that philosophy can resurface as gay science. And Deleuze responds, so the question that interests us in relation to A Thousand Plateau is whether there are any resonances, common ground, with what other writers, musicians, painters, philosophers, and sociologists are doing or trying to do, from which we can all derive greater strength and confidence. When he responds like this, it will of course not seem strange that a late 20th century French philosopher who inhabited the university and in some sense thrived within the terms of its protocols, in spite of the horror stories of personal professional rivalries between lecturers competing for the loyalty of the students and tendentious haranguing during seminars, it will not seem strange that such an academic should become the philosopher du jour of artistic research, a philosopher whose work has become a necessary and ubiquitous reference within the intellectual culture now reproduced by the 21st century university. Indeed, it would seem that the Deleuzean lexicon is creeping toward a kind of hegemony in the critical practices of the university across the humanities, and also in the research rhetorics of artists and practitioners. But how are we to think about this language change? It is clear that Deleuze has exercised himself on this question also. And again, drawing on the 1980 interview, he's challenged on this question of language and the turn to linguistics. Some people might be surprised by the prominence given in A Thousand Plateau to linguistics and might even wonder whether it's not playing the central role reserved in anti-Oedipus for psychoanalysis. And yet one gets the impression that what you're trying to do is rather to condemn linguistics pretensions, to close up language within itself, to explain utterances in terms of signifiers and utterance in terms of subjects. So how should we take the importance ascribed to, ling to linguistics? Or are you just very peculiar linguists who are only interested in what is outside linguistics? In response to the question, Deleuze, I don't personally think the linguistics is fundamental. Maybe Felix, if he were here, would disagree, but then Felix has traced a development that points towards a transformation of linguistics. Initially, it was phonological, then it was semantic and syntactic, but it's turning more and more into a pragmatics. Pragmatics dealing with the circumstances of language use with events and acts was long considered the rubbish dump of linguistics, but it's now becoming more and more important. Language is coming to be seen as an activity, so the abstract units and constants of language use are becoming less and less important. It's a good thing. This current direction of research, precisely because it makes possible convergences and collaborations between novelists, linguists, philosophers, vocalists, and so on. Vocalists are what I call anyone doing research into sound or the voice in fields as varied as theater, song, cinema, audiovisual media. The potential here is enormous. When we call out for your attention in these dialogues of the academic conference, we are also calling attention to the communities of practice that make our work possible. Doing this, we necessarily question the tired romance of the solitary monologue of genius and those repetitions of the same, the same, the same, masquerading as the always new again. But even as we call attention to our dialogues and our communities of practice, we wish to keep faith with other conversations elsewhere that call out for us to attend upon them also. Perhaps the migrant dead talking underwater also call out addressing us. 
Listen, may we succeed. Listen, may we succeed. So in respect of lines of flight, I've spoken from a double agnosticism, a double not knowing. I don't mean a theological agnosticism that pronounces that certain first things cannot be known, but something more akin to Thomas Huxley's atheological agnosticism. When Huxley produced the term in 1869, he claimed to indicate simply that he did not know the things that early Christian Gnostics claimed to know of first things. As Huxley put it, his new term agnostic was suggestively antithetic to the, Gnostic, to the Gnostics of church history who professed to know so much about the very things of which I, Thomas Huxley, was ignorant. Interestingly, Huxley links this agnosticism to Hume, uh, to human skepticism and defines it as a specifically modern thought style. Of course, Thomas Huxley is an embarrassing old 19th century Oxford Don, and as a dusty old Victorian controversialist and a champion of confident evidential science, not really the kind of intellectual collaborator that one should invoke in a discussion of contemporary artistic research. But in any case, here today, in respect to Deleuze and artistic research, I've been speaking with a double agnosticism. On the one hand, I speak with a limited familiarity with the Deleuzean corpus, the kind of half not knowing anything much that any contemporary academic working in the arts and humanities today in Europe might reasonably be expected to hold as a consequence of a certain ascendancy of Deleuzean citation. So I indicate agnosticism as a kind of literal not knowing of the corpus, not knowing it well, just knowing that it is there. It is seen to be generative for a wide range of disciplines, inquiries, and practices. And on the other hand, I operate a secondary not knowing, premised on the first, of not knowing what use or force operates across the mobilization of this corpus and its generative flows in the contemporary university and contemporary art. I suspect the Deleuzean ascendancy we have been in for some time is not entirely any one thing, but multiply multiple in its multiplicatious ways. It's plea, it's many foldings, working in some moments progressively in the sense of forging new connections, enfolding sites of relative privilege and sites of absolute deprivation and in other moments working regressively in the sense of shoring up sites of privilege and ensuring the maintenance of beautiful souls folded in upon their refusals of contaminant flows and secured from the messy incursions and the seepages of bodies in flight and the horrors of slow attrition liminal living in contemporary capital, bodies exposed by the failure of our institutions. But my purpose here has been the modest one of looking at the way in which one of these Deleuzean figures has been deployed within the specific context of recent artistic research debates. Particularly what interests me is a kind of appropriation of Deleuzean lines of flight within the rhetorical field of artistic research and an associated metaphorics of exceptionalism, revolt, resistance, and refusal. This appropriation cannot, I think, simply be resolved by saying you are misreading the text or that you are not using the concept tool correctly. I'm suggesting that it proceeds from a form of bourgeois revolt. I'm describing this bourgeois revolt as a rhetorical practice that inhabits institution, resources, statuses, offices, but disdains institutional responsibility because the institution is defined essentially and irredeemably as a hopelessly closed system. My proposal is that the bourgeois revolt, this contemporary bourgeois revolt, finds exactly what Deleuze proposed might be found in the text. It finds resonances. It finds common ground. And this is a problem. But I am also conducting inquiry through the work of rhetoric. I'm also speaking with a forked tongue. Deleuze Guattari writes of a dissolution of forms, a passage to the limit or flight from contours in favor of fluid forces, flows, air, light, and matter, such that a body or a word does not end at a precise point, 
We witness the incorporeal power of that intense matter, the material power of that language, a matter more immediate, more fluid, and more ardent than bodies or words in continuous variation. The relevant distinction is no longer between a form of expression and a form of content, but between two inseparable planes in their reciprocal presupposition. We orators, we speak of our brothers and sisters who are drowning, having crowded the boats, the metaphors that shuttle across our sea, boats in repeating waves, in daily errands of desperation, now drowned. Some of our brothers and sisters are granted European citizenship posthumously. They become our dead fellow citizens, so they may be buried on this side of our sea without the cost of ferrying the sea-wet corpses back to an African or a Levantine shore. And we, the drowned and the saved, now sing, and we, the drowned and the saved, must sing that we have come from sleep, that we have come from sleep. We are addressing you. Yere ke yere wo, we are addressing you. Ye rei ke ye rei wo, listen, let us succeed, listen, let us succeed. Thank you.